worshiping with us at this time, I'd invite you guys to be seated, invite the children to go on to flourish worship, and we'll get started. Let's continue in prayer. God, thank you so much again that we can be here together and in your holy presence. As we gather before you, give us ears to hear the word you have for us, that, that word that creates worlds and uh, creates new life in us. God, would do that creative work and make us to be the people you would have us be for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I remember back when I was a, a little boy taking swim lessons at the community pool. And it's one of those things where taking swim lessons seemed like a great idea. And on a sunny afternoon, learning to swim was something I really wanted to do. But early in the morning when I actually go, went to my swim lessons, jumping into the pool was not all that exciting for me. I was sitting there, standing there with my swim trunks on, and I know the pool's cold, and it's cold outside, and the last thing I want to do is jump in, but that's what I'd signed up for. you got to go for it, and of course, over time, I got better at it. I never became a great swimmer, but I learned to swim. It makes me think about what it's like for us following Jesus, living as Christians in this world, that sometimes the church, sometimes we kind of try to sell the church, self-following Jesus as this just wonderful thing that's all fun and exciting and full of joy and never a problem with it. Of course, that's not true. In fact, Jesus makes it really clear that if you're going to follow him, you're going to face persecution, which maybe in our nation we don't face to the degree they do for sure in other parts of the world right now. But if we're really going to follow Jesus, we've got to live a little counterculturally, a lot counterculturally. And that's not always encouraged by the in fact, it's sometimes looked down on by the world around us. Following Jesus, Jesus says, means denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him. Paul does the same thing, where he talks about this life in Christ as being something that, in his experience, brought him all kinds of challenges. He talks about all the different trials that he went through and speaks of it as being an honor for him to suffer for Christ, but that it's suffering for sure, no pretending about it. In the book of Romans, one of those places where he lays out for us what it means to actually not just sing about being a Christian, not just sing about following Jesus, but to follow Jesus. He's been talking in the his letter to the Christians in Rome about the grace of God working out in history, uh, working out in what Jesus has done for us, this amazing, abounding grace of God that enables us to be forgiven of our sins, to connect, reconnect with God, and to know that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. And in chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, he, he turns a corner to talk about how what this means for us in terms of living our lives. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of 
God, what is good and acceptable and, and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to, to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in the body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter and exhortation, the giver and generosity, the leader and diligence, the compassionate and cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I, I can just picture Paul writing this letter to people he cares deeply about living in Rome. These brothers and sisters in Christ, these Christians who he just longs to see, understand how much God loves them, and experience living out that life God gives them in their daily lives. I, I can imagine him praying, Holy Spirit, would you inspire me to write just the right words that will help them to not just sing about your love, celebrate your love, but to live out your love in their lives? What should I say, Holy Spirit? And then he begins to write, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, this is what he writes. I appeal to you. God loves you so much. His mercies are so great. I appeal to you, therefore, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. This is the call. To commit ourselves to living as a living sacrifice. And Paul's very clear what that means for us. I've often said that the first thing he talks about after saying live as a living sacrifice is to live in community, to live learning to love each other and love the world. But it's actually not the first thing he says. It's the thing he says. That after saying that we shouldn't be conformed to this world, that after he says to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, he says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. For as in the body there are many members, he goes into the body, he goes into this body life. He's saying if you're going to commit yourself to Christ, you have to commit yourself to Christ's community. That if you want to be alive in Jesus, the only way you can be alive in Jesus is to be alive in his body. That's countercultural. No wonder Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. The world's always been that way. And here in America, it's that way more than ever. We think of ourselves as individuals. That's the way we think. That's the way we live. And Paul says, don't be conformed to that way of the world. The way we live in Christ is by living in community, by committing ourselves to the community of Christ's people. It's the only way to be alive in Jesus is to be alive in his body. You know, we've been going through this sermon series talking about rekindling the, the, the gift that God gives us, this gift of faith, this gift of life in Christ, this gift of ministry, mission in the world. And you think about a fire. If you've got all the logs spread out, it burns out. It doesn't burn well. You've got to come together. And this is critical for us when we've been talking over these past weeks about things that we can do to kindle, to rekindle that flame of faith, of life in Christ within ourselves. This one is crucial. We've got to come together. 
We've got to be together. We've got to commit ourselves to Christ's community. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, a similar letter where for the first three chapters he's been talking about the grace of God and how God's taken the Gentiles and the Jews, these people that were divided, and he's made them one people in Christ. And then he takes off in chapter 4 where he turns the corner and he says, I beg you, therefore, to live a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And he goes on to talk about living with humility, with patience with one another, bearing with one another. There's one body, he says, just as there's one spirit. This is the only way to live the life in Christ. We've got to commit ourselves to Christ's community. And what that means is that we are dependent on each other. Just like in my body, my arm can't go wandering off on its own and stay alive. It's got to be connected to the body. So too for us, it's so tempting in our world. To say, I'm going to be a Christian, I'm spiritual, and I can do it on my own. But members of a body can't do it on their own. We are dependent. We depend on each other. We need you for the body to be healthy, and you need us. You need the body to be healthy. We're also, in a sense, independent also. In a healthy body, my arm is different than my leg. This is what happens in the womb when a healthy baby is being developed in the womb. It's one body, but it begins to develop different parts of that body, and they're very distinct from each other, and yet they're connected. Like us in the body of Christ, we ought to be very distinct from one another. You ought not think exactly the way I think. Your gifts are not going to be exactly like my gifts. If we're all marching in the same lockstep together, we're going to be a cult. We're not looking for that here. We're looking to be a healthy body, a healthy community in which we are dependent on each other. But we're also independent, growing ourselves as a full, whole human being. Because then we can be interdependent, right? Then, like my body, my legs and my arms can work together in an interdependent way, helping each other out so that when one part of my body is suffering, other parts of the body can do some extra work. But their aim is not to just do that forever. They want to help me get healthy in every part of my body. That's the best of all. And for us, too, we commit ourselves to this community. And the ways we do this, Paul goes on in this passage To say, you do this, you commit yourself to Christ's community, first of all, by serving. You live to serve in the community of God's people and together with the community of God's people in the world. You live to serve. Verses 4 through 7. He says, for as in the one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And and I think about that word there. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Some translations say, according to the grace given to each one of us. The Greek doesn't say that. There's truth in that, that God's given you certain gifts, certain resources, As a blessing to you, that's grace for you, that you get to have abilities that you can contribute to the community. But actually, the Greek doesn't say each of you, it says us. The the gifts God gives you, the resources God places in your care, these are given to you as a gift to God's body. That we are to use our gifts because we're living sacrifices to Christ, right? Right? So anything we have, this life we've been given is to be lived for him. We live with our gifts, our resources, as a part of the body. By the grace given to us, God gives us these varied gifts. And he goes on. It's a representative list, not a, an exhaustive list. You can look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in Ephesians chapter 4. There are other places where other lists of gifts are given. But this is a great representative list. If your gift is prophecy, which means basically proclaiming the word of God, like preaching would be an example of that. Do it with all the faith that God gives you. If your gift is ministry, and and that word in the Greek is diakonia, it's the same word that deacon comes from. So if your gift is to serve in a role in the church, a ministry of the church, have some functional way of serving, whether it's official or not, then serve in that way. 
If your gift is to be a teacher, then teach, right? If your gift is to be an exhorter, which means to be an encourager of others, then be an encourager of others. If your gift is giving, God's given you resources, God's given you a heart to give, to support the body and to help others, then he says, give generously. Actually, you'll read in some translations, it says, give sincerely, because the word in the Greek is kind of a combination of generous giving that isn't given for your own sake. It's not like, I'm going to give you this $5 because I'm hoping you'll thank me. I'm hoping that I'll look better if I, we're going to do a stewardship commitment Sunday in another month or so. Hey, I'll, we don't increase our giving. We don't give to the church so that people will think we're cool. That's not why we give. We give generously, but genuinely, because we, that's who we are. That's what God's calling us to do. Uh, if your gift is leadership, then here I expect him to say, then lead. But that's not what he says. He says, then do it with diligence. And every time I've come across that, I'm like, well, for a long time at least, it's like, why diligent? Why not, if your gift is leadership, then lead? And when I've gone through challenging times in leadership, I've begun to realize, oh, that's why it says <laughs> do it with diligence. Like it's one thing to be the leader of a community, a church, when everybody's in agreement and everybody's happy and we're moving. The, and it's another thing to lead when it's hard. And that's when God says do it with diligence. You know, I think about this election, presidential election year that we're going into. And honestly, I've said to God, do I really, are you, you really, do I have to lead a congregation to another presidential election year? And his answer has been, yeah. Yeah, you do. This is the gift I've given you, the call I've given you. You lead through a presidential election year. You challenge, you lead, you exhort your people to follow me. No matter who is elected, to act with the character of my people, no matter how anybody else is acting. To remember that your hope is in me, that there's not going to be any human leader that's going to be your savior. You keep your allegiance to me and follow me. So you'll be hearing more from me, and I hope from each other over this year, because it's going to be hard for us. It's going to be challenging. And we've got to encourage each other to follow Jesus through this election cycle. We need that. Our world needs that. That's our real job in this world is to represent Jesus. And then he goes on, if your gift is compassion, again, I expect him to say, then be compassionate, but that's, it's not what he says, then do it cheerfully, which makes sense. If, you know, I'm sure Paul saw it. We see it in the church sometimes where, you know, somebody's really compassionate, they're really caring, but over time we get kind of burned out. Nobody's saying thank you. Nobody's coming over and helping us be compassionate. And we start to, you know, we still serve the coffee, but we're doing it with a frown on our face. We may be helping somebody out, but we're spreading misery at the same time. He says, if you're going to show compassion, <laughs> then do it cheerfully. In fact, the Greek word behind this is the word hilarity. <laughs> I love that. If you're going to show compassion, do it with joy. We live in the community to serve. Second thing is we live to love in the community. This is where we get to practice loving, where we get to learn loving. It's not easy to love. The word that Paul uses here, let your love be genuine, that word for love is agape. It's the kind of love we see in God as Jesus comes to us. It's a self-giving, sacrificial love. It's this love that desperately desires the best for everybody else. And so Jesus says, they'll know you by your love, right? By your love for one another. And in fact, he talks in Luke 6 about, you know, everybody else says that you should love those who love you, but I say to you, you know what I'm going to say, right? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who abuse you. That doesn't mean you're going to let people abuse you, but it doesn't mean you're going to start hating them either. I mean, you might have to work on it, but the idea is that we pray for those who abuse us. We can put up a boundary. We get help. We call the police. We do what we need to do. We walk away. But we also pray for those people. 
because we want the best, just like God wants the best for all of us, we practice that in our relationships. And we practice that especially right here in our community. This is kind of like our own little um, laboratory in which we get to practice the things that we want to live out in the rest of the world. Let love be genuine. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I just love that. I pray that that would be our desire here at Salem, is that we're going to be competitive. We're going to try to outdo each other at doing love, at helping each other, at showing honor. That's, we want to be really good at that. Later on in the chapter, he goes on to say, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. That's part of what it means for us to love each other. And part of what we learn in life is that those two things go together. We're never, ever just a community that's rejoicing. Sometimes we think, we get this myth in our heads that a community should be utopian. You know, like if we're really following Jesus, well, it'd be just like me saying, if I'm really going to follow Jesus, I'm never going to sin anymore. I'm never going to be. Like, no, if we're really going to be a community together in Christ, it doesn't mean that we're going to be a perfect community. We don't get to do that in this life. We've got to keep working at it. And in the midst of that work, in the midst of that seeking to love, we're going to be weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice, often at the very same time. Because even within ourselves, we're often doing that at the same time. I was with some people in the past couple of weeks doing a couple of funerals, and these people were laughing with the memories, the joy. At the same time, we're crying because it's painful and hard. That's life. We can do both of those things together at the same time. And as a community, that's a part of what we're called to do. We've been through hard times at Salem Covenant Church over the decades. And in the last couple of years even, we've gone through some difficult times. There's grief in our relationships. There's pain that we've endured. But there's also joy as we worship. There's joy as we see Christ's spirit moving among us. We can hold those things together. And when one of us is weeping and really feeling the grief, we can say, yep, it is hard. And yet we can also rejoice in all the good that God is doing, and we can put one foot in front of the other and encourage one another forward. We can do, as Paul says in this chapter, rejoice. Uh, what is it he says? Uh, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. We do all that at the same time. We rejoice in hope. We are patient as we suffer. We persevere in prayer. We keep on going through it all, through the joy, through the pain. We keep on doing it because the third thing I'm going to list up here, committing to community means that, well, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to God means we live for God. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's what we're called to. Now, I think about some of our students here as they're getting toward graduation from high school. You know, what do you want to do with your life is one of those questions that we ask. But it's not quite the right question if we've given ourselves as a living sacrifice to Christ. The right question is, what is God calling me to do with this precious life he's given? What is God calling me to do with the gifts he's given me? You'll find that that's fulfilling for you. But it's got to be that. That happens later on in life, too. As we find our interests, our jobs changing, our gifts, abilities changing. Even as people approach retirement, you know, People ask, what do you want to do now that you're retired? The question is not just what do you want to do. We live for God. So with the gifts God's given you, they're probably different than when you were 18. Your resources are probably different now. What is it God's calling you to do now to live for him with the gifts he's given you, with the resources he's given you? As a part of his body, to build up his body, and with his body, to do God's good work in the world. We commit ourselves to Christ's community. We live to serve in and with Christ's community. We live to love in Christ's community and with one another in the world. And always, we live for God. If you're like me... You get weary at times. Life is hard. Life in community is hard. 
But Paul says, do not lag in zeal. Be ardent, be enthusiastic in spirit. Serve the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you that you call us together. There are times when we'd like to just go off on our own, and maybe for a little bit that's a good thing. But God, help us to do the work of being committed to your body. Help us, God, to experience the joy, even amid the challenge, of using the gifts you've given us to help the body of Christ, your church, flourish and bear good fruit in the world. Help us, God, to love one another. And God, may the love overflow into the world that you are calling us to love in your name. It's in your name that we pray.